Net Wealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with net wealths. The guests, organization, and net wealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through the net wealth platforms, and net wealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about net wealth can be found on our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please seek professional advice before acting. Hi, I'm Matt Heiner, Joint Managing Director of Net Wealth, and welcome to Between Meetings. In this podcast series, I chat to industry professionals and thought leaders on what made their career successful and the opportunities and challenges they see on a wide range of topics as they relate to the delivery advice and financial services. I hope you enjoy their unique insights. In this episode, Paul Campbell, Managing Director of Zeppo, shares his career journey and the reasons why he ultimately founded Zeppo, a data and business management platform. We discussed the important role of data for business efficiency and how practices can use their data in a more insightful way to unlock opportunities. We also discussed the common traits of firms that are best at adopting tech, the structure of advice in the next three to five years, and how practices could approach their data strategy. And finally, Paul chats through highlights from his three months of traveling around Australia and exploring the Kimberleys. As always, I hope you enjoy the episode. Paul, great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, Paul, I'm not sure if you can hear it, but apologies in advance. Someone's decided to mow their lawn and chop down trees uh, next to where I'm <laughs> recording today. So the, the beauty of, uh, of COVID and, and, and recording from home. I can hear fine. Excellent. Now, Paul, I've been very fortunate to work with you and also the broader Zeppo team uh, in official capacity since September 2020, I think it was, when we invested uh, into Zeppo um, and very happy shareholders with 25%. Um, but for people that haven't uh, met you before or aren't aware of your sort of background, I thought it'd be really helpful if you could just give us a bit of a potted history about what you've done and, and why you started Zeppo. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I started in the IT industry, if you go back to original career in the first 10 years of my life. Um, and then came across a guy called Ray Miles, who uh, just announced his retirement actually the other day. So that's a bit of a, a, a pivotal moment. But uh, he was at Associated Planners and uh, they needed a lot of help with their technology back in uh, the late 90s. And uh, got in, started getting involved with them around building a CRM system, if you can believe it, um, in Lotus Notes. So you, it's really starting to make me feel old. Um, but it, anyway, I got involved with them and then uh, eventually actually started working for them full time. And so 2000 started the to work for Associated Planners as their IT director um, in, dealt with implementing VisiPlan, uh, if you can believe it, right back then and saw that through. And then two years later, moved into the operations role within the business as it started growing very rapidly. And then um, not long after that, we Associated Planners formed into Genesis Wealth Advisors, the, uh, the, the merger of Garrisons and Associated Planners. So I did that until 2007 and uh, had a great time. Uh, I think we presided over you know, 400 or 500 advisors by the time we were done. Uh, stepped down the same day as Ray, actually. And then uh, about a year later, uh, the GFC hit. And uh, as a, I'm not sure how that all played out, but um, got uh, approached to run Retire Invest. And, and uh, that was a great, you know, I wasn't really sure about that to start off with. It was a great challenge for me. And um, obviously at the time it was ING Australia and yeah, it was baptism by fire. It wasn't a, uh, a lot of angry advisors when I walked in there um, in 2009, I think it was by the time I was there. And then, but four years of fantastic experiences, great team. And it was really good. And obviously throughout that we had the GFC and also all the FSR stuff coming or FOFA actually for that point. And then also ANZ taking over the, over the uh, ING Australia. So lots happened in that four years and, um, and then left in 2012, uh, founded OPEX Consulting. And then a couple of years later, we founded Zeppo. So yeah, that's, that's the high level 60 second overview. Yeah, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. And I think you've got a very unique perspective when you think about, I guess, your journey during that time, but looking at it through both an operational lens, but also a technology lens, uh, the amount of change that occurred yeah. during that period if you think back to the technology usage of advisors back when you started um, with Ray, you know what what was the focus? What were people using technology for, and what were they wanting technology to do for them? Yeah, like the internet wasn't really even a thing in those days. Like people were using ISDN and dial-ups. Like it really starting to sound like a dinosaur. Um, 
So intent, it was really email. That, that was probably all it was really used for in those days. And then technology was, you know, the Visi plans were all installed in, in your office as standalone servers. And I guess the game, nothing's really changed in that regard. They're all just trying to make the process more efficient. Um, obviously, the regulations were not nearly as uh, complicated as they are now. But, yeah, they're really just trying to um, still generate advice, still do portfolio administration, and obviously CRM or customer relationship was a big thing in those days. But if you go right back then, VisiPlan didn't really have a CRM. It was purely a an SOA generator and a portfolio administration system. So one of the things we did was we actually built uh, was a product called Atlas. We, we, we codenamed it, and that was basically a CRM system where, you know, it you know, file noting, workflows, the whole lot. So nothing's really changed. I think, you know, we, we kind of look at Zeppo and think we're, we're 20 years on and we're still trying to do the same thing, just trying to use technology better. And, and that was really going to be my next question. You've gone through from uh, some fairly significant organisations, managing lots of advisors um, and presumably with a balance sheet uh, to setting up your own business um, through OPEX and, and ultimately Zeppo. Uh, what was the inspiration behind doing that? Uh, so at the end of 2012, um, you know, I've always been coming from a small business. So Associated Planners was a very innovative, very progressive country, uh, company. And then you go to larger organisations, as much as the balance sheets are there, there's obviously a lot more risk focus. So it was actually harder to be innovative in an organisation like that because you spend more time managing risk. Um, so at about 2012, we could see a lot of things happening around us. And I actually went to a... Um, a leaders conference, actually, one of the uh, professional planner summits, and they had a futurist speak there. And he just talked about how data is going to become at the middle and how the client's going to be right in the smack in the, in the middle of all of that. And so things are going to change. So we kind of saw two things happening. We, we kind of felt the banks were going to get out of it because it was just getting too regulated and, you know, they couldn't make money out of it as in terms of transactions. And we also felt there was a convergence happening. Whenever we went and talked to practices, uh, we would see there's an accounting or a lending arm to it as well. So we would talk to the practices and say, like, how are you doing this? How are you going to bring those businesses together? And the word holy grail, the phrase holy grail was, was used a lot. So we really identified a need based on the trends we were seeing, having been in the industry for so long. We could, we could see things were changing quite fundamentally with the, the GFC, the regulations, the banks. There was, there was some tectonic plates moving at the time. And when you think about the change over that period, um, and particularly over the last five years, and I've spoken a little bit about this lately, just the, I guess the intentions of the industry to adopt new technology and to use technology better in their businesses hasn't matched the actual adoption or implementation. Uh, what do you think is driving that? Is that just because the industry has been busy and distracted by everything else going on? Yeah, like regulation and change has just uh, been constant for the last almost 10 years, really. I know when COVID hit, for example, advisors, I think, took it on the chin quite gracefully because they've just been dealing with so many massive challenges along the way. It was just another another battle for them to fight. Um, so I think my observation when I was at RI is we, we spent a lot of time having to deal with the regulations and trying to find ways to help the businesses run their business better. And innovation and technology got put to the side a bit because we were just dealing with trying to interpret what to do. And I think probably... Maybe two or three years ago, everyone just woke up and went, oh, wow, we, we need to catch up here. We've, we've actually been so sidetracked with all these other issues. Technology has to be a major play now. And, and dealer groups really turned from being an innovative, collaborative group from when I started with them to becoming, you know, helping people transition regulatory and, and, and uh, business change and the, um, investment changes. So, um, yeah, I think I think that's what's distracted us, and I think you can see now, like you know, yes, uh, net wealth itself has seen it. Is that people are now embracing change rapidly because they realise it's so key to them being able to navigate through through the next coming challenges of their business. So, and and through that transition, um, you started OPEX as you touched on, uh, which was really supporting existing enterprise solutions. How long was it before you pivoted and decided that? the solutions out there weren't working for you and that you actually had to build your own. Yeah, we kind of started that thinking when we first started the business. We thought, you know, we, we've got to be innovative. We can't just look at using traditional software like the X plans, like as good as they were, you know, what's coming next. So we really started looking from the day we started the OPEX. It probably took us two years before we kind of saw more clearly what the need was. And we kind of took on a big, uh, hairy, audacious goal, and that was to deal with data, um, you know, particularly on like so much data was starting to flow across the, the businesses. The businesses couldn't actually get hold of it. 
was locked away in bespoke systems. And as your tech report shows, there's like 14 or 15 systems in play. So data was, you know, we saw as the fundamental thing we had to overcome. So we started that journey, I guess, two, probably two years into OPEX. And, you know, we didn't even know if we could do it. Like, you know, we knew there was data locked in accounting and planning. And, and so the first thing was, can we even get the data out and bring it together? And what were the hardest things for you when you started the business? Where, where did you spend most of your time and what were the big challenges you had to overcome? The hardest thing is when you do something that no one's done before, like bringing that data in and presenting it to practices. You know, well, the first day we, we actually put it together and showed our first client uh, perks, they said, this is amazing. And they looked at the data, said, this is fantastic. And then they quickly said, well, what do we do with it? So it was like, oh, so it's like having a smartphone with no apps. So... We kind of went, oh, okay, so what do we do now? So we then started having to build tools, I guess, and functions on top of the data to actually make it uh, usable out of the box. So we've constantly been trying to navigate um, how do you make this data more useful and, and straight, like, without a lot of work. So, you know, advisors don't have time to figure it out themselves. They need you to figure it out. So the biggest challenge has been just turning that into enablement um, because it's not... And as far as I can tell, there's no other real Zeppo out there that's that's tried to tackle this challenge to the depth we have. So it's really been kind of charting uncharted, uncharted waters. Um, so yeah, we're we're still trying to find our way through it sometimes, but we're getting a lot of clarity now. But yeah, that's just solving that problem has been huge. And this might seem like a basic question, but why is data so important to a financial planning operation? Well, I think... It's efficiency. It's about making their business run better. Um, and if you've got good data and you've got good access to it, you can start using it through systems and automations. Um, and, but first of all, you need to get into an environment where you can actually connect it to the tools you want to automate with, not just have it locked up in one tool. So, you know, for me, the key is data to unlock those opportunities. And I think my observation today is we've been building and working with software over a long time where they're getting, we're kind of just, incrementally improving now and not fundamentally improving and with all the changes they've had this year they actually need much more significant efficiency gains than what than just incremental change so they need time and they need efficiency more than ever and to me data is what unlocks that you know you've got to be able to connect it to systems easily same way your phone is you can just install an app and it connects to your contacts we, we need apps to work in those ecosystems and we need data from all your sources in the one place first and when you talk about data, how, how wide is the data gamut that you're talking about? Well, it's wide and deep. So, you know, we're covering financial services. Um, so that's, you know, uh, fact find data, insurance, investment data, um, revenue data. Uh, and we then replicate that in the accounting world. So same kind of thing. Uh, self-managed super funds, lending. Um, they'd be the key ones we would cover. Um, so, yeah going through that much diversity, the, the data model, as you can imagine, is pretty big. Um, the key is then bringing it down so that the client connect, or the, the practice rather, you know, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. So we've got to try and bring it down into digestible chunks so they can actually look at it and d slowly get down into the depth of the data based on need. You, you said earlier that uh, you built this fantastic data warehouse or data platform and then had to work out what to do with the data. What are some of the interesting use cases that you've seen practices um, adopt or even create themselves sitting on top of your platform? Yeah, a couple of ones. Probably the first one was um, being able to identify opportunities across the verticals. So accounting firms, uh, what, what another thing when we started Zeppo, going and talking to firms, you generally found, you know, they might have 15 to 20 staff in the financial planning, but they have like 150 sitting in the accounting division. And they would always say, look, I know there's so much untapped business there for us. We just can't get to it. So the first one we started doing was trying to correlate data between the two divisions. So identify accounting clients that would benefit from financial advice. So that was probably the, the quickest ROI in terms of, you know, they could just start getting referrals across in a much more efficient way rather than just hoping the account would remember to refer. So that's one. Uh, revenue analytics, a lot of them don't know what their clients are worth to them. So again, integrated firm, how much is that client actually worth to me across the divisions and where are the service gaps that again are opportunities. So they're probably the two most common areas where they would be driving new business and uh, know your client stuff. Um, Marketing is obviously a, a, a no-brainer. You know, again, 
they that kind of led to the first other problem, I guess, which which is at the front of everything is data quality. Like names and addresses are generally not in sync across their systems. And so that was one of the first things we solved is show them the client uh, data and say, well, here's an email address that varies. Date of birth, you know, you might see fifth of the first in one system and first of the fifth in the other because someone's just mis- uh, keyed it back to front. So they're probably the obvious ones we've tackled is just um, leveraging the data that they've got. Um, not so much change management issues, just, you know, immediate benefit of getting data in the one platform. Uh, again, you touched on earlier just the need to actually identify or understand what it is you're going to do with the data. How should practices think about data and how should they start their data journey if they haven't yet? Yeah, well, I think they would have. The first thing is to get into one place, like get the data into an environment where you can actually see your data um, in a much more insightful way. So we use things like Power BI, for example, to visualize data. Um, looking at it on a spreadsheet, it's so static uh, or in a report, you can't really manipulate or interpret that. So we found Power BI, for example, a fantastic tool to give to them in their hands and just start clicking around and actually understanding their data. So, you know, we'd always encourage them, get them into the platform. And let's just start presenting your data in new ways that actually starts you on that journey. Because as soon as you see, for example, total revenue per client, um, you'll start asking questions about, okay, maybe we're not charging enough or maybe we're, you know, why is that client, uh, you know, not generating as much revenue as that other client? So it will start generating questions and, and then you start getting on a roll and you say, okay, well, that tells us we need to start exploring other avenues. So, and particularly with practices now moving, a lot of them moving to own AFSL land. Um, you know, they need to understand where their business opportunities lie and they've got the flexibility to be a bit more innovative in some ways to do that um, in those cases, like maybe think about an accounting firm, that kind of stuff. And as far as the data requirements uh, between a licensee, own AFSL, practice within a larger licensee, how are you seeing that change? So I think the data is pretty much all the same. You know, we're, the, everyone's driven by the know your client rule in the AFSL. Um I think it's probably more just uh, practices and own AFSLs. You know, it's like moving house. They've just got a fresh look to what they're doing in some cases. So they're just trying to um, look at their data in new ways because they're in a new environment. Change, change creates it. It's like moving house. So I think this, it's, generally they're all the same. There's not a lot of difference. They're all operating the same. They're all trying to do the same thing with their clients. Um, it really just depends on what state of their business is at and what they're actually trying to achieve. So start start with an objective, grow business, um, service your clients better, understand service opportunities, those types of things. Before we bring you the second part of this chat, a little bit about who we are. Celebrating over 20 years, NetWealth is an ASX-listed company that has been rated number one for overall user satisfaction by investment trends for eight consecutive years in their Planner Technology Report. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives and realise new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your business thrive. Contact us today or visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS, which should be read before making a decision to purchase a NetWealth product. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. And once the data's in good condition and you've cleansed it across all the various enterprise solutions, um, one of the debates that we hear within financial services, but probably all industries, is the debate around single system uh, or core system through uh, and then partnering through a broader ecosystem. Do, do you have views or are you seeing those models evolving in the industry and do you have a view on, on how it's going to look in the future? Yeah, we're seeing all sorts of different models now. So you are seeing people who are sticking with what I call the traditional model, one, one monolith type system uh, and just relying on it. In some ways that's simpler, right? I just have one product. It, it, it's easier to deal with in terms of connectivity. Um, the problem with that is you're relying on one vendor to get everything right. And the way the industry is moving from a tech perspective, that becomes difficult. So then what you start doing is a core and satellite approach where you start, you know, harnessing specific solutions into that. Um, that then leads you to, do you stick with the one main product and build around that? Or do you bring it into an agnostic platform and then build around that? Um, so that's where you're seeing different decisions and practices, um, 
making decisions around where they want to go based on how agile and how free they want their data to be. And, and obviously, if you then start adding other verticals in, what we would say in that case, you definitely need to put your, your data into an independent platform and connect to those specialist systems. So connect to your specialist accounting, connect to your specialist financial planning. So um, all the models are in play from what we're seeing. Um, probably depends on the size and complexity of the business and their ability to um, deal with um, one or many systems. Uh, that's probably the biggest challenge, right, is how do they actually have the resources and the time to focus on it. And the firms that are using technology um, or adopting technology uh, the best, is there any common traits that you're seeing across the industry? Yeah, I think they've got a really good progressive attitude. So they are, they're wanting to embrace technology as a solution. So they're challenging technology to help them solve the problems knowing that technology is a part of the problem and they need good people and they need their people to face into it properly. So there's no question we see a good solution when they've got a, a person who's the champion and who leads it and makes sure that it runs by the numbers both with the vendor and also with the staff internally. So there's daylight between that. You know, I can a couple of implementations, we've implemented the whole thing in four or five weeks because they've just had somebody on the game making sure everybody's doing what they need to do and it works really well. Um, I think they realise that technology is another resource. They're not sitting back expecting the technology to make the problem go away. They realise it's a resource as part of the solution. So attitude, I think, is probably the biggest difference. You know, they they know they've got to embrace it, but they're not expecting it to do it for them. They've got to do it. You know what I mean? Like the technology, you can you can put a really bad process into a system like a workflow. You're going to get a really bad outcome just because it's got a workflow tool doesn't mean it's a better outcome. So it, the the input is key. Um, a lot of the conversation today has been focused on, obviously, data and back office efficiency, um, compliance. Um, what are the trends that you're seeing when it comes to the client engagement piece and what advisors are doing to create that that digital environment or digital relationship with their clients? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think it's the most obvious one we're seeing is digital signing, starting with the basic. That's now becoming very prevalent um, where it's a, it's a much more efficient experience for the client to read it, click it, send it back. Um, Obviously, webinars because of uh, because of COVID. I've still not client apps. I think are have been talked about since you know Adam was a boy. Um, the problem that when you sit down with a practice, they'll say, "Yeah, I love the idea of a digital engagement tool," but they're generally lacking in confidence in the quality of the data that they want to surface to the to the client. So it's it's back to that data quality issue that if if they're not confident in their data, they're not confident to put it in front of the client. I'd argue that in some ways, if you get the journey right, the client will help you validate the data if you get it to them. So we're seeing some practices embrace it, but I think we've got a long way to go and we've got to give them tools in terms of client apps that are um, easier to implement um, and ones where you know they're, they're connecting to all the right data points. So I think we've still got a long way to go on that one. Possibly a good good segue into a bit of um, a bit of future gazing. Uh, you currently deal with most segments of the market, so you've got high net worth clients, you've got smaller practices, you've got licensees. What are the big trends that you're seeing, or where do you see advice, and what's the structure of advice in say three years time and maybe five years time? Yeah, I think that's a good one. Um, well, it depends on what this. You know, there's obviously a consultation paper going around about trying to simplify advice, but. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is advice is not easy. I think the one thing that we probably forget is if it was easy to give advice to a client, anyone could do it and you could automate it a lot easier than what you're doing. So I think we need to remember that advisors is a very specialised skill and constructing advice is complicated. So I think what we need to see in a trend around technology is a different way of doing the SOA than what we've seen traditional. Still relies very heavily on um, discretion and experience of the advisor to then pass it to the power planner is still a very complicated, uh, slow process. So I think we're going to see a lot more uh, tools focusing on that problem. We're obviously starting to see digital advice tools come out. Um, so I think we're in the very early days of that. So I think we will see a lot more automations and intelligent tools around advice. How far they get obviously depends on what the legislation allows them to do. Um, Automated advice, I think, makes sense for the for you know large employer groups and stuff. Advisors now don't have you know they've got to service their clients, so it's going to come around not just advice but also the cost of delivering advice from the back end of the front end. So a lot more automation, I think, will be the key and trying to use the smarts that technology offers today. So um, 
again, if we can get through all the regulatory change, we can then focus on how do we actually make these things happen quicker and better. Uh, potentially a loaded question. Uh, there's a, a plethora of financial planning softwares these days uh, and more seem to launch uh, every week. Realistically, how many different solutions do you think the industry can support moving forward? Uh, not as many as we're seeing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. I think obviously there's a lot of innovation happening at the moment and some of those innovations will survive, some won't, and there'll also be mergers and consolidation, I think. So I think we've got to let the innovation play out a little bit more. Um, you've got your traditional products and then we've got these new emergents. So um, it will definitely grow and then consolidate. And it probably depends on who's playing in the market as well. So obviously IWF have got their product initiative. Um, I think the instos are all trying to build a new offer that's unique to them. Um, and then obviously you've got people like Iris who are also going direct to platform as well. So um, I think there's more to play out. I don't know exactly how many, Matt. There will, I think it will have to consolidate at some point though because you know, um, the industry is not that big to, to support that many products. And, and getting smaller. And yes. given, that, given that these are some absolutely critical business decisions for a practice and really do underpin uh, everything in many ways, what, what's some advice that you would give to practitioners, uh, technology managers or practices that are looking at buying or selecting new technology? I think always start with a plan. So to me, technology is a resource like your stuff. So you have to be really clear on what your strategy is and then how are those resources going to help you get to your end game? So have a really good plan. I mean, that's that's basic fundamentals. But And then I think you need to research. Be clear on what you want. Look around the market. See what's available to you and look and pick the one that best suits your requirements. So, you know, there's, there's nothing new in that. But I think you've also, to your point earlier, you've got to look at the backing of that of those people. Are they are they a startup? And if you're going to invest in a three to five year vision with a startup, like, you know, what's the risks involved with that? So I think uh, backing and confidence that that technology will be around for at least three to five years is critical. So um, where your data is stored, who owns the data, to me, what you should be looking at now is that you own the data. So, you know, you need to be in control so products can come and go. Your data stays with you constantly rather than having to worry about a data migration. So I think if it was me, I'd be saying, right, I'm going to mandate data, not product. That's my first step. And then I'm going to get systems to connect to my data and then I'll run my ecosystem that way. So to me, to flip it on its head because at the moment you go to the product, you're stuck in there, then you're going to move to another product and if you, you lose all your agility. There's better ways today to do that. Um, and then commit resource to it. The last thing is, as I said earlier, if you don't put uh, people focused in your business on it, you'll get a half-baked result. Um, you can make any product work pretty well if you invest in it. I think that's great advice. And certainly as part of your onboarding or sales process is to actually do a bit of a tech audit. Um, yep. is, that, is, is that something that you're finding has been really helpful for practices and are people often surprised by what comes out of it? Um, they definitely find it helpful. I think... Yeah, it surprises them and then that they've got more choice than they probably think. Uh, what's really interesting, we had a, a Zeppo conference and uh, the first year everyone said we want more choice. So, you know, what Zeppo does obviously is gives them a lot of choice. And the next year everyone said, we're really confused. There's too much choice. <laughs> so I think what people want is a preferred tech stack. They, they want to start with something that is... So one of the things we're doing is we're building, a, I guess, a best practice resource library where we come to them and say, look, You've got choice, but here's a starting point with what we'd recommend as a good config. And then that definitely helps them to kind of fine tune based on the nuances of their business rather than coming with a blank sheet of paper. So um, it's just too much for a business to absorb with that, with like, well, what do you want? So um, they're definitely wanting guidance. And, and I think obviously when you go to your own AFSL, for example, you start needing a lot more partnerships going on to guide you objectively. Um, because there's, you don't have that institution kind of making those decisions for you. Better or worse, you know, they made those decisions so it was easy. Now they, they've kind of got to do it themselves. So, and they've got to own the outcome. Yeah, so I've, said, I've noticed a few consulting business starting to merge in the marketplace where they're, they're coming out as independent advisors because um, I think that's what the licensees want to feel like. There's someone on, who's got their back rather than the product vendor um, just selling their pitch as being the pitch. So... I think we'll see more of those kind of uh, partnerships emerging as well. And given how quickly technology is evolving and how many new players are out there, what are some of the really interesting things that you're working on that you're excited about? 
Oh, lots of things. I think the, the big things that we're talking about is obviously just digital automation and document automation. So the one thing that I really like is just using better what you've got now. So Office 365, most people have got it and they're probably using 5% of it and that's probably exaggerating it. So one of our kind of uh, passions at the moment is getting people to use more of what they've got. So let's integrate your Office 365. Your SharePoint actually has emerged as quite a good document. Uh, management system in my view we tried to implement it five years ago as a, it just didn't work it's a completely different product the practice is already paying for it so so what we're looking at doing is integrating and leveraging what they've got as much as buying something new so we've got to see more connectivity between the the products so it's it's probably an incremental change than a revolutionary change which is what i think practices are up for so how do i use sharepoint within and automate it with document signing and connect it to my uh, client data so it's one, one touch uh, automations. And that is a great use case in my mind where we're just using what they've got, but we're providing massive or significant efficiency gains, which is what they're after right now. Just give me some time back. Don't give me new complicated systems. Give me Just give me simple solutions that I can incrementally improve. So I think breaking it down into nice digestible chunks is a key focus for us. Um, so that's one example where it's actually not that, not that exciting, but I think for the practice, it's it's pretty exciting for them because they, you know, they, they can get on with it simply. And in the accounting space, ah, uh, well, time sheeting is an interesting one, right? So, what's interesting about the accounting industry is they're coming from a completely different place. For the last twenty years, we've been talking about best practice and client value propositions and experiences inside the financial planning industry. It's been all about client engagement and CRM. The accounting fraternity is coming from a tax return mentality where it's, it's actually um, you know, looking backwards in a lot of ways. And so for them, you know, they do a file note, the tax return and, you know, and timesheet. They are now starting to move towards the CRM world where they need to be uh, changing the way they engage with the clients. And in many ways, you know, I would say that they're catching up uh, to the financial planners in terms of that. Obviously, professions and all those, there's lots of other debates. But um, so as, what we're seeing inside the, fun, uh, the accounting space is they want to start embracing CRM automations a lot more. So they are looking at efficiency as well. So, for example, we're integrating the Zeppo data warehouse with things like uh, Zero, so all that time sheeting can be brought in. So they can work in inside Zeppo and they can collect time sheets and sync them straight back to their accounting systems in one in one go without touching it. So that's really going to step us and allow us to give accountants a much more integrated, true workflow environment, um, but still allow them to build out of their core system. So. That's the big one we'll be working on. So that's pretty exciting. Fantastic. And presumably, if people want to find out more about Zeppo and any of those services, uh, just head to the website. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, there's lots going on and we're always happy to chat to people. Paul, before we uh, we finish up, uh, you were recently lucky enough to take three months off and travel around Australia. Uh, first of all, how was it? And secondly, um, how did you feel stepping out of the business for that period of time? And what did you need to do to prepare yourself? Yeah, well, the, the trip was amazing, 11 weeks up through the Kimberley and the Pilbara and uh, managed to avoid all the COVID lockdowns. We, we came back into South Australia the day they lo- uh, uh, lifted the six-day lockdown uh, in August, I think it was. So, yeah, that was amazing. Um, just seeing Australia in the Kimberley. Uh, the Kimberley was awe-inspiring in terms of the, the natural beauty up there. Um, and it gives you a good, good time to just think about your priorities and, and just to keep it simple, right? So it was fantastic is, is in, in summary, and I'd recommend anybody to explore that part of the region. Um, you can't travel the, the globe, but uh, you can definitely see a fantastic country. Um, it was an interesting time to leave, actually, because we were doing a massive growth uh, as a result of the partnership with, with NetWealth. We were uh, busy in uh, executing our strategy, and first step was to recruit new staff. So um, the good thing for me is I've got a great leadership team. And they're actually not needy. Uh, on the trip, I was ringing them to find out how things were going. They were not ringing me. Uh, so the, I think the key is if you've got good staff that you can trust, it, it makes your life very easy. And in fact, you know, I, I was probably missing them more than they were missing me. They were probably enjoying the peace and quiet. So it was nice. I came back and uh, for that three months, they'd, they'd done a great job of recruiting the team. And, and I think they learned a lot about themselves without without me being there interrupting them all the time. So um they probably want me to go on another 11-week trip, I suspect, just to give them some airplay and leave them alone. So um, that's a good thing for both of us, I think. Did you manage to tune out or did you actually come back with a head full of ideas and then dump it on the team when you returned? Uh, I really tried not to do that. Uh, that lasted a couple of weeks. Um, but, yeah, 
there were times when you like I think when you're disconnected and there was no mobile service, we went along across the Goob River Road, and obviously you just tuned out. But not having technology is probably the best way to relax because you got no choice, right? Um, but when we got to somewhere like Broome that week, you kind of started tuning back in and making phone calls. So um, probably did that a couple of times. But once I realised the staff didn't really want to talk to me, I, I probably relaxed even more. Um, but when I came back, yeah, I had lots of ideas, but the key was uh, just let the staff kind of, you know, like the, the leadership team and the staff just keep doing what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit of both. Paul, that's been fantastic. Uh, it's been some absolute uh, gems in there around sort of technology adoption, the future of advice, uh, but more importantly, just what practices and, and firms need to be thinking about as they embark on uh, the next technological roadmap. Uh, we look forward to obviously working with you. We've got lots of exciting things planned um, and no doubt we'll do another podcast um, soon to see how it's all going. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate the time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Between Meetings. For more episodes and to subscribe to our series, visit the NetWealth website, iTunes, Spotify, or your favourite listening service. And if you want to contact me or engage or discuss any of the topics raised, please find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or send me a private message. We hope you can tune into the next episode.